From the Auto Line Studios, here is your host, John McElroy. I want to thank you for joining us on AutoLine this week, where we're going to be talking all about American Honda. And that's because my special guest today is Mike Akavitti, the Senior Vice President of Automobile Operations at American Honda. And great to have you on AutoLine this week. It's great to be here, John. Thanks for having me. Also joining us today are Paul Eisenstein from the DetroitBureau.com and Michelle Krebs from Edmunds.com. And great having the both of you here, too. Great to thank be you. Here. Well, Mike, let, let's look at where things might be going. 2013 ended up strong, well over 15 million units. In fact, since the Great Recession kind of ended in 2009, we've seen the U.S. industry growing. What's your outlook for 2014? Well, we continually see growth as in the market. We're a conservative company from our forecast standpoint, John, but we do consider that 2014 is going to be as strong as uh, 2013. You are a company, or Honda is a company, that uh, really focuses on retail sales as opposed to fleet sales that go to some of the daily rental companies or other corporations. Uh, but that seems to have held you back a little bit. Your sales are up, but your market share down ever so slightly, just a fraction, but down nonetheless. Why the strategy on focusing so strongly on on retail sales? Yeah, we, we don't chase market share. Uh, what we look for is continual, steady growth. Um, retail share is important. Retail sales are important because that reflects the true demand of the customer, the, of the marketplace. Right, fleet sales are, you know, some guy giving a phone call to a fleet manager at some, you know, rental car place and, and we, they dump a bunch of cars. and That doesn't really reflect the demand for the, for the vehicle. What we see with true retail demand is customers are putting their hard-earned money down. It helps us protect the residual value of that customer's investment. And we win awards from the likes of Edmunds, from ALG, from Kelly Blue Book, because we have these high residual values. So it's important for our customers that we maintain this retail strategy. But Mike, some people would argue, certainly Ford would, uh, that re that fleet sales are pretty profitable. There, there's fleet and there's fleet. Uh, fleet sure, fleet. sure, the industry got itself in a lot of trouble dumping it into daily rentals. But I think Ford would go out there and GM and say, wait a second, we're making tons of money going into government fleets and corporate mm -hmm. fleets and the like. And this is the philosophical difference, Paul, is that, uh, yeah, companies have found a way to, to make fleet profitable, which is great for the company. But Honda's philosophy is on what's great for the customer. And for the customer, uh, slow fleet strategy is better because of the high residual values that it produces. It helps us as well because when people are putting their money down, real people, and they have great experiences with Honda, they're talking about it. And they're sharing great word of mouth. And that helps us with our, get our marketing message around to the rest of the consumers. Whereas if you're selling to commercial fleets, you don't really get that word of mouth advertising. But when, when you have the new version of the Ridgeline come back in a year and a half, wouldn't you like to have some fleet to get that vehicle out there as a serious competitor in the truck market? We don't look at uh, fleet as a necessary for us to achieve our sales objectives. Even with the truck? Absolutely. That brings up an interesting point. Uh, we, we're seeing GM get back into that smaller uh, truck market. You're sticking with it despite all the rumors that maybe you're out, maybe you're in. Can you talk about that segment of the market and what you see it doing? We see there's, uh, you know, without going into great detail because of it's a future product for competitive reasons, um, we see a, a market segment that's forming. Uh, it's transitioning from what a small pickup truck used to be. And so we see, um, car, we see trucks, excuse me, that maybe a contractor would have to drive to the job. It's not necessarily a work truck. It's a truck that allows him to have the utility and flexibility that he wants from a pickup truck, but he doesn't have to have the sacrifices that are generally associated with a pickup truck. Be careful, though, if one of those contractors buys two or three ridge lines, them's fleet <laughs> sales. <laughs> that's right, yeah. yeah. You got a point there, because that's how we calculate fleet, right? Why, why stick with the ridge line? Uh, in the end of 2013, sales really shot up dramatically, but the numbers are puny. I mean, puny. You're selling barely over 1,000 a month. Yeah, it's kind of a niche truck, John. I mean, the styling doesn't appeal to everybody. The utility is limited as in compared to a full-size pickup truck. And so, yeah, we're very pleased with the sales growth that we have experienced this year. 
but we think there's greater potential, and that's why we're coming out with a new Is drug. Is that segment coming back? A lot of people are debating that. Yeah, I wouldn't say, I don't think it's coming back. I don't think that it's, I think the decline is stopped. I mean, what we're seeing with the full-size pickup trucks, uh, they're starting to come down in price, and they're putting a squeeze on that mm -hmm. mid-size segment. But there are still people out there that prefer the size of a mid-size truck because they, uh, their personal lives or because they you know, go in a lot of parking lots and it's important for them, but they still want that utility, right? And so it's, uh, it's a segment that we believe has shrunk down to about as small as it's gonna get. I don't see it wildly growing, but uh, we do see it maintaining steady. Fines. Well, let's talk about the other two segments that you're in, the, the small car segment with, with Civic and the midsize. Those are dog fights where midsize and Accord and Camry just determined to keep that top spot. How do you, you know, hang in there? Well, we're very pleased with the performance of the new Accord and the new Civic. I mean, we are the retail sales leader here. Again, it's very important to us. And... Um, what we have found is over the last couple of years, the competition has put out the strongest product that they have mm -hmm. ever put out, yet we maintain our leadership position. So that's a testament to the great engineering and manufacturing capabilities at Honda, and uh, it's something that we want to continue to, uh, to be a leader in. Does it mean you have to keep refresh more often than you intended, or...? Well, I don't know about as intended, but yeah. we, within our plan, though, Michelle, we have, you know, we have strategies on how we're going to maintain that leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, fuel economy leadership mm -hmm. is very important to us. Safety leadership is very important to us, and technology leadership is very important to us. And so you've seen the Civic this, last, this year, 2014, is actually the third major change that we've done in three years. So we're continually improving that. And our philosophy at Honda has always been, that we're never satisfied with what we have. And our, we're destined, or we are, we are programmed, I should say, to make something great and then immediately figure out how to make it better. You, you, you talk about the dogfight out there. A couple of interesting things happening. Uh, we're seeing proliferation like we've never seen. What is G, uh, Ford, I think, said they're going to do 23 new models next year in this market alone. And uh, everybody's flooding the market. So. That raises a question. Uh, how much more do you have to add? Do you, do you see the need to fill still more white space or existing segments? And, and secondly, how do you avoid the problem that Honda's had in the U.S. over recent years where your core products slam it, just, just dunk, and some of your niche products miss? So, I mean, that's always the risk with a niche product. And as we move forward, you're going to see Honda focusing more on our core segments. And so, um, you know, we'll be making some changes to our product lineup as we move forward that, that reinforce that. We want to, uh, of course, focus on our powertrain development and powertrain technology. We want to focus on our packaging leadership. But uh, you're going to see less participation in some of these niche segments and, uh, and greater focus on core segments. In my understanding, <clears throat> in my understanding, you're right, that where everybody's proliferating, filling every white space, you folks would... Much like you prefer retail, you would prefer to narrow your lineup? You're, you would drop segments and not fill up new ones? Yeah, to an extent, Paul. I mean, what you may see is derivations on certain platforms, but still that core platform will be, you know, we want to focus on that and perfect that. I mean, that's why we can sell over 300,000 Civics and Accords and uh, CRVs. Uh, Accord had its third best sales year ever in 2013. Uh, so we're, we're very pleased with, uh, with the volume that we can stretch out of, uh, out of a single platform. Mike, you talked about uh, fuel economy leadership, yet uh, Toyota continues to dominate something like, I don't know, 70% of the hybrid segment. Your hybrids are sort of okay, but what do you got to do to turn that around, or can you? We believe we can. And again, electromotive technology is something that is, we, we feel we have a technological advantage over many of our competitors. Um, what we're going to be focused on are new hybrid technologies like you see in the RLX sport hybrid model where we have three hybrid motor system. It's a unique solution and there's nobody else on the market that has that technology. The new two motor hybrid system that we put in the Honda Accord allowed it to achieve the highest miles per gallon on any hybrid in a five-door or five-person sedan, right? 50 miles a gallon. 
And so you're going to see those types of technical advancements making their way in across other products in our lineup. But will people buy them? I mean, you, you, you've got the EPA numbers. The, the sales are minuscule, though. Yeah, what you're going to see is, uh, is uh, pretty pretty significant leaps in miles per gallon delivered from hybrids and uh, as we move forward. And we feel that those will be compelling enough, those gains and will be compelling enough to attract more people into the hybrid segment. Even though gas prices might not, they aren't exactly helping uh, hybrid sales with them being relatively low. That's really. true. There's, uh, you know, I mean, there's really two kinds of hybrid buyers. If you take a pen and paper out, it, it's, you know, sometimes it doesn't make a lot of sense to buy hybrid on a payback right. basis. Um, but uh, if you're concerned about the environment, you're concerned about range, um, the statement it makes. Exactly. What does it say about me? And so that is uh, where we're seeing some, some growth opportunities. Well, one of the things that I find interesting is that with your three-motor Acura Hybrid, you're putting an emphasis on performance, not just fuel economy. Do you think that there is an emerging market for people who like to get performance, whatever the process, maybe, be, maybe are being turned on by electro performance? Absolutely, that's a great question, Paul, and we, we feel exactly that. We feel that what's wrong with the current, or the problem with the current hybrid offerings from some of our competitors is they, they're not fun to drive. They lack that element. And a lot of people want to enjoy the experience of driving, and we feel that we can deliver on Honda brand promise of fun to drive and great fuel economy with this hybrid technology. So that's where we are focused, not just with the RLX, but even the, uh, the other hybrids that we're going to be coming out in the future. Will you change your marketing accordingly? Because hybrids up to now, and electrics especially, have been marketed as save the planet, do your part, blah, blah, blah. It hasn't worked. I mean, the, the industry is just not generating sales in huge numbers. Why not talk about, from a marketing standpoint, more about the fun-to-drive aspects? Well, that's what we're going to be doing with the RLX. 30 miles a gallon in a big sedan like that, 30, 30, 30. That's very, very good delivery of a fuel economy. And yet it's a blast to drive, and it delivers uh, experience that no other car can deliver, front or rear wheel drive. And so we're very excited about marketing that as a performance vehicle. And again, we'll continue to do that as we move forward. You talked about safety leadership, too. Uh, Honda's probably been the most aggressive of any company adopting uh, or designing for this uh, insurance uh, institute standard of what they call the, the small offset. You guys seem to be aware that this was coming along far better than just about any other automaker. Certainly Toyota, which, of course, got slammed by Consumer Reports, of all things. Well, I tell you, um, th this company, and, and I've only been with Honda now for a little over two and a half years, but this company really believes in saving people's lives and really believes in the safety of our customers. And because of that, that's why we got a head start. Because they were, the engineers were already working along this path, right? They understood that there was a risk of uh, people getting hurt with, um, you know, avoid trying to avoid an object, and so that frontal offset was an area of opportunity. So they're already working in this place. And so when the IAHS announced that they were going to do this, we had a head start. Conscious decisions were made when we were developing the new Accord to sacrifice fuel economy to improve the safety of that vehicle. And it, it, it allowed us to get top safety pick plus. And, but you know, we didn't have the fuel economy crown, which some of our competitors did. But we could tell people, this is why, right? This does is why we did does it. top safety plus sell cars? Any type of safety sells cars. Uh, people. People do assume that all cars are safe, and it's a little bit of an alphabet soup out there with everybody mm. saying we have five star this or four star that, and consumers are a little bit uh, confused. So we're going to be clarifying our message moving forward on just exactly how safe Honda vehicles are, and you'll be seeing more of that. Uh, Can you give us a, a heads up, as it were? On, okay, darn it. Well, yeah. we'll just have to watch and, yeah. and see for When you see it, John, you're going to go, yeah, yeah, that's what he that's was what talking he about. Right. <laughs> What are the top priorities of consumers now? We keep hearing fuel economy, you'd say safety. What? What's segment, what is it? Is segment dependent, Michelle? I mean, you know how, how um, you know, every consumer of every car has a different reason. And we try to categorize and, and lump and things. You know, what we're seeing post recession is value for money is really important. Mm -hmm. uh, it used to be price or deal offered, right? right? Number one reason people bought a car, number one reason people rejected a car, price or deal offered. And what we're seeing now is that value is more important, right? So it's 
It's, um, you know, what am I getting for that money? I'm willing to pay a little bit extra if I'm going to get something in return for it. So that's becoming very important. In some segments, technology is important. In most segments, fuel economy and safety, they always rank in, you know, in the top, top five or so. Um, styling, of course, is important. So it does really depend on the, uh, on the segment and, of course, on the individual consumer. So, you know, our challenge us when we try to sell 300,000 of a vehicle is how do you, how do you please all those people? Mm -hmm. yeah. Every single year. Right, right. <laughs> Mike, there's been so much talk about natural gas as a fuel. Up through right now, Honda's the only car company selling a passenger car. But we're starting to see more trucks. Uh, GM announced they're going to have a CNG buy fuel, gasoline and natural gas Impala. A any outlook? Uh, your CNG sales were up very strong in 2013, but again, the numbers are very small. Yeah, it's, with any type of alternative fuel technology, it, um, you know, it becomes a, an issue of infrastructure. And we're very pleased at Honda that we're one of the only manufacturers that has multiple alternative fuel technologies in the marketplace today. Right? We have a, a CNG that you mentioned, we have a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle, we have electric cars, we have hybrid cars, we have gasoline cars. And we're gaining real life information from customers on what they like and don't like about these vehicles. One of the things, the concerns we get from the CNG people is infrastructure. Where do I go to get my, uh, my fuel? And, uh, you know, but at least they have a nice range and people that have them, they understand where they can get them and it, where they can refuel. And what we do with our Honda uh, CNG Civic is with, on the NAV system, it will tell you where the nearest CNG filling station is. So you never really have to have anxiety over, you know, where, you, where it is that you can fill Speaking up. Speaking about alternate fuels and uh, lack of infrastructure, you guys are one of the three makers that have so far this year uh, well, I should say in 2013, we're talking about getting into hydrogen. Serious, serious commitment to hydrogen. Uh, let's talk about that. Well, we feel the hydrogen fuel cell is, uh, you know, it could be, I don't want to say the perfect uh, way to propel uh, an automobile, but it, it's, it's very close, right? It produces uh, water as its byproduct. It's relatively cheap uh, to, um, you know, to consume, and uh, you can get uh, good performance out of it. We've had hydrogen fuel cell cars on the road in Southern California for a number of years. And uh, again, we're learning from that experience. That is truly a case of infrastructure development. I mean, you really have to, uh, and it's a chicken and an egg, right? Mm -hmm. You need the cars to get the, you know, it doesn't make sense to put in a station if you don't have any cars, but you can't put the cars in because you don't have any fuel stations. So which are you, the chicken or the egg here? <laughs> I think we're probably a little bit of both. And so, but what we're doing, I mean, we're very pleased with some of the things that, uh, that uh, government's doing in California to uh, put some seed money out there to put in some, some more infrastructure. We, of course, have some infrastructure around the Southern California area, uh, some that uh, very close to our office that we can utilize to, to fill up our cars. But um, it's something that we feel is, uh, it is a technology of the future, and it's, uh, it's uh, an area where, obviously, we're not the only ones thinking that way because our competitors have announced some vehicles as well. Yeah. Where, where is Honda, kind of what is your philosophy going forward in terms of the autonomous vehicle or the semi-autonomous vehicle? How are you approaching that? Great, uh, great question, Michelle. What, what we see is, uh, you know, there's, there's going to be different consumer groups that have right. different feelings about this, this technology. Uh, I was up at Google uh, a couple of weeks ago and had the chance to you know, see and experience their autonomous car, and it's pretty cool. It's pretty interesting. Um, some people prefer to be the, you know, I've got to drive, I want to drive. Right? True. But some people like, well, boy, wouldn't it be great to get some work done while I'm, uh, my car's driving itself to the office? Ultimately, we feel the responsibility must fall on the driver to operate that car. Mm -hmm. So a fully autonomous car is it's something that just doesn't box with the way that, that we see the world. Uh, I think that'll be a matter of great discussion as we move forward and as this technology develops, mm -hmm. is who ultimately has the responsibility for that vehicle. Uh, we issue driver's license to people to operate a motor vehicle, and uh, that's why we feel it's important that drivers maintain that. We can't leave that up to the machine or the manufacturer. So what will you have out when? Because you have to get into technology with all your competitors saying they're going to get there with something. Well, what we have is, you know, we have bits and pieces are out there today, right? We have mm -hmm. lane keeping assist systems on some of our Acura vehicles, which keeps you in the lane, you know, and, and steer it for you, you know, steer it for you. We have uh, 
uh, adaptive cruise controls with low speed follow that can take you all the way down to a dead stop and then start back up uh, when the, the guy in front of you or the girl in front of you moves. Uh, so we have elements that are out there and uh, it's just a matter of how do you tie all this stuff in together and uh, you know, it's something that, uh, of course, we're working on, Paul, and of course, we're, we're developing. We haven't heard that from Honda. We've heard from almost all the other major automakers in the world. We have not heard Honda come out and say anything about autonomy. My question is, would you just go buy it from Google? They've got it. Well, of course, that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's also a matter of, uh, of discussion, and it's a very interesting thought, right? I mean, it's, it's, uh, if, the, if the market does end up going this way, uh, like with, with a lot of technologies, do you end up buying it from somebody else or do you spend the money to try to perfect something that somebody else already else has developed and I guess you cross that road when when you come to it right it depends on how easy it is to integrate all this stuff and, and whose solution uh, that is actually uh, you know if somebody has a solution that's technologically advanced that you figure there's no way we're going to be able to get that so it's, it's not something that's high on our radar screen I mean what we're doing right now is focused on on improving our internal combustion engines and developing our alternative fuel technologies, working on our packaging and safety uh, advances in technology, working on our entertainment technologies, and uh, you know that's those are really taking precedence over uh, all of our uh, other activities. You raise an interesting question that a maker like a major maker has to face these days. If I go back when I started covering the business back in the 70s, you, you dealt with styling, a little bit of fuel economy, a little bit of safety. But there wasn't an awful lot on the plate. You could get cars out there with, with a reasonable focus. Now it seems you have to pay attention to everything. Safety, fuel economy, new technologies, even, even interior materials are becoming more and more a, a critical part of whether you're going to be competitive or not. Yeah, I mean, the, the consumers have had such great, it's a great time to be a consumer in anything, right? I mean, it's, it's the age of the consumer, age of the customer right now. And um, you know they are just demanding that excellence in every touch point that they have, and uh, so it does become a challenge for us. And like I said, we're we're dealing with limited resources, like a lot of other companies, and we're focused on what we feel are the right things. So many of the other automakers in North America now are are straining to meet demand. You know, they they cut back so much back during the Great Recession. How's Honda stand? Uh, are you guys continue to grow? Do you have the manufacturing footprint that you need in North America, or will you have to add to it? Well, Honda has invested um, $2.7 billion over the last three years in North America, quietly, to improve the capacity of our, you know, of our operations here. We're in the process of uh, launching a new plant in Celaya, Mexico, that's going to build our fit and our new uh, small SUV. And so we're, we take a very thought out calculative approach to adding capacity, right? And we want to make sure that once we add capacity that we need it for the long term. It's not something that we, we don't ordinarily open something and close them. And we, I don't think we've ever closed a plant here. And so uh, this is, uh, continues to be our, our way of uh, operation. We uh, feel with the new added capacity in Mexico, we'll be close to about 1.92 million units that we can make in North America. And uh, we feel that that's going to cover our needs in the short term. I mean, you, you bring up a great point. I mean, our plant in Marysville, Ohio, produced 100,000 units in the last, you know, last two months. It's fantastic, <laughs> yeah. Last two months? Yes. That's a lot of cars. Yeah. Of course, that's a huge facility, yeah. too. Yeah. So when you look over your shoulder these days, your traditional competitors were, of course, the other big Japanese makers. But who really is coming up on you these days? Who do you worry about? I worry about everybody. Everybody. <laughs> I think that. Yeah, this is a tough <laughs> I think that. That. Everybody, right? I mean, it, um, in, in this business, you can't take anybody for granted. And uh, because that's what happened to, you know, I was a long, long time big three. And, uh, you know, that's kind of what happened to us is just never mind these guys. And all of a sudden, you know, the, yeah. the J3 kind of took off. And uh, you're seeing, uh, you know, Hyundai and Kia, of course, are very strong. Subaru is doing very, very well. Tom Dahl's doing a wonderful job. They're and, almost uh, becoming the Japan Four. I'm telling you, we're, you know, we're we got a good eye for them because we we actually uh, Subaru. There's a lot of cross shopping that goes on. Actually, a lot of cross shopping that goes on with Hyundai as well. Yeah. I mean, uh, so those are the those are the ones that uh, that we watch. 
Volkswagen, you know, we're, we're always watching on what they're going to do as well. I mean, because we feel that, uh, you know, they have some pretty strong goals. And, uh, you know, it's just, uh, you know, a matter of time till they dial in the, 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 right, the right formula and uh, that they're going to be someone that we're going to have to watch too. Yeah, Volkswagen uh, has been a little bit weak in the U.S. market, but uh, they've got SUVs in the pipeline. That's the one gaping hole that, that they have. Mm -hmm. you, you talked about a, a new smaller SUV or crossover coming out of your, your Mexican plan. Any thoughts of going on to the, the bigger end of things? Um, well, we have our eight-passenger pilot, and uh, you know, right now that uh, that's doing it's doing well for us. Uh, we feel that there's always opportunity for us to do better, and so for the the next full model change that you see on that vehicle is going to be, uh, you know, a significant improvement. And uh, we feel that uh, right now that that's really the uh, you know the space that we have to focus on. And your minivan, the Odyssey, you're you're one of three companies that have stuck with minivans. Retail leadership in that minivan segment and it's really a nice car i mean it really is and uh you know we we, ought, we introduced the honda back this last uh new york auto show and it was been very very well received and uh, we continue to invent and perfect that model as well and with that we're going to have to wrap it up but mike akaviti thanks so much for coming on autoline this week great having you here thanks for having me john paul eisenstein michelle krebs great having the both of you as well and i want to thank all of you for having tuned in <music>